Section 2 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Bryce Allen, Woodbridge, Virginia. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book of Toronto. Section 2. Introductory. Men who live by hunting and fishing. The men of the frozen north. Far, far to the north of our province live the Eskimos. Their land is very cold. For nine months of the year the snow lies deep over all the ground, and thick ice covers the water. For months during the winter the sun is never seen at all. <clears throat> Terrible blizzards often rage for days together. When the sky is clear, the bright stars help to lighten the gloom. The northern lights, which can be sometimes seen flickering in the sky, are much brighter in Eskimo land. Their greenish radiance casts a weird light over the snow and ice. The summer is only three months long. During that time the sun never disappears from the sky, but it does not give nearly so much heat as in our country. It is always low down in the sky near the horizon. Its slanting rays melt the snow and ice from the southern slopes that thaw the surface of the soil. Mosses, lichens, and coarse grass grow on the cold ground during the summer. No trees or grain or fruit, such as we have, can grow there. A few varieties of berries which grow in the warmer parts of Eskimo land are the only vegetable food Eskimos can get. They must live almost entirely upon the flesh of animals to eat. The Eskimos are a race of people quite different from us. They are shorter than the men of southern Canada, but sturdy and strong. Their skin is yellow, their hair is straight and black, their faces are broad and rather flat. There are not many Eskimos, but their country is so cold and poor that there is food enough for only a few people. During the summer, the Eskimos live in tents made of skins. The tents are small and easily moved as the Eskimos roam from place to place in search of food. During the winter, they have and round houses built of blocks of snow. The thick snow walls of their igloos keep out the keen winds. A block of clear ice serves as a window. The door is only a hole in the wall, so low that the Eskimo has to creep through it. A tunnel of snow is built up to the door to keep out the wind. A curtain of skins hangs over the doorway between the tunnel and the house. The big, furry dogs, which pull the Eskimo sled help them in hunting, are sheltered in the tunnel. The Eskimo has no furniture in his house. A bank of snow covered with furs serves as a couch and bed. In the middle of the house stands a cooking lamp which burns oil made of melting the fat of animals. It has a wick made of dried moss. Over the lamp hangs a stone pot. In this pot the Eskimo melts snow and stews the fish of the animals which he catches. Sometimes he manages to get an iron kettle from some of the white men who come to his land to catch whales. Most of the Eskimos live on islands. These are separated from one another and from the mainland by wide straits. In the sea around the shores live seals, walruses, whales, and fish of many kinds. Of these, seals are the most useful. They provide the Eskimo with warm fur for clothing, with fat to burn his lamp, and with meat to eat. The Eskimo makes his own weapons and tools. His spear is made of bone, sharpened and barbed at the tip. A long thong of hide is tied to it, so that he can throw it into the water at seals and fish and pull it back again. The framework and runners of his sled are <clears throat> made of bone. The harness for his dog team is made up of strips of hide. He makes a serviceable boat by stretching sewn seal skins over a framework of bone. He finds that small, sharp splinters of bone make good needles, and that tough sinews make excellent thread. Like this, 
Like us, the Eskimos are fond of games. They run races and play football. They skate with bone runners fastened to the soles of their skin shoes. During the long winter nights, they play many indoor games with bones and leather strings. Often the men carve pictures of sleds or bears or dogs on pieces of flat bone. Most Eskimo boys do not go to school. They know nothing of the world except their own bleak land. They do not know what farms are, or factories, or railways, or stores. They have only one ambition. They want to become great hunters. They spend much of their time with their fathers, learning to hunt and to fish or to make weapons. The U.S. Eskimos are able to live without many of the things which we use. Most of them have no wood, no coal, no iron, no gardens, no farms. Yet they're able to get food, cook it, build houses, make clothing, tools, and even play things. They cannot have the comforts which we enjoy because their land does not produce so many of the things which help us to live comfortably. They cannot get these things from us because they live so far away. There are no railways in their land because of the ice. Ships cannot reach it easily. Therefore, these Eskimos have almost no trade with other people. Of course, those Eskimos who come in daily contact with the fur traders and the mounted police live as much as white people do. They live in heated houses, wear clothes, and eat food very like our own, and enjoy many modern comforts and conveniences. These Eskimos depend on their living chiefly upon the whaling and fishing industry. Men of the Northern Forest before the white man came to America, the Indians hunted over the whole continent. They did not know how to work iron, so they tipped their spears and arrows with chipped stone. They also made hatchets called tomahawks out of stone. They dressed in clothing made from skins of animals and lived in wigwams to, or hide or bar, of hide or bark. As white settlers kept coming out of the greater and greater numbers from Europe to America, they gradually spread over the sections of the country which were good for farming. Large tracts of ground, called reservations, were set aside for the Indians. There were several such reservations in most of the provinces in Canada. They are Indians, they are Indians farm as we do, dress in a similar way, and live in much the same fashion. Lying to the north, between us and the cold Arctic regions, is a broad stretch of country which the Indians still live in and hunt as much as they used to do. Nowadays, of course, they use rifles and cartridges instead of bows and arrows. They have good steel knives and axes instead of stone tomahawks. The hunting grounds of the Indians are covered by the northern forest, which stretches across the whole continent from Alaska to Labrador. Part of this great forest of spruce and fir lies in the northern part of our own province. The ground is for the most part rough and rocky, with many swamps in the low parts. There are innumerable lakes and countless streams and rivers in this part of Canada. The winters are long and cold. The snow lies deep on the ground for six or seven months of the year. The winter days are shorter and the summer days are longer in southern Canada. The short summers are quite hot, so that several varieties of wild berries grow in profusion in the woods. Along the edge of the forest there are many trading posts. Usually they are built beside large rivers. A great many of them belong to the Hudson Bay's Company, which was formed in England over 250 years ago. There is a store at each post where the Indians can buy flour, bacon, beans, canned fruit, blankets, tobacco, knives, axes, rifles, ammunition, and many other things which they need. They give the storekeeper furs in payment. Some of these furs are sent down into southern Canada where they are made into caps, coats, muffs, gloves, and capes. Many are shipped away to other countries. Good furs are, as you know, very valuable. By the beginning of June, the rivers in these regions are all free of ice. Then the Indians come paddling down to the posts. The summer is their holiday time. They camp close to the trading post and trade their furs for the goods which they need for the coming winter. 
By the end of August, the trader's store is filled with bundles of furs, and his stock of goods is almost exhausted. Then the Indians start back to their hunting grounds. The rivers <clears throat> are their easiest paths into the wilderness. In some places, the rivers are broken by rapids or falls, and then the Indians have to carry their canoes and their goods along the bank until they reach calm water again. Sometimes they paddle so far a river that it becomes too small to float their canoes. Then they have to carry these and all their belongings over land until they reach another stream flowing in the direction in which they wish to go. This is called portaging. The high ground between two rivers flowing in the opposite directions is called a divide. The Indians know well all the divides in their hunting grounds. The Indians live out in the forest all winter, often hundreds of miles away from the nearest trading post. The families live in tents by themselves. The nearest neighbors are probably 20 or 30 miles away. There is no lack of fuel, for the forest provides plenty of firewood. They can build as big a fire as the uke in, the camps, in their camp stove and keep their tent warm and comfortable. As soon as there is heavy snowfall, the hunting begins. The trapper sets out from his tent and walks in a wide circle around it. At every place where he sees the tracks of animals he wants to catch, he sets a trap baited with meat. A trapping line is usually about 20 miles long. Every day or two, he makes his round of his traps on his snowshoes. Often he catches a muskrat, sometimes a fox, or a mink, or an otter, or a beaver. Occasionally he gets a shot at a lynx or a wolf. He is very glad to shoot a caribou or a moose, for the flesh of these animals is very palatable, and their hides make excellent moccasins. The bears sleep in dens all winter, so the trapper does not see any of them until springtime. Of course, there are no paths or roads in the forest, yet the Indians seldom lose their way. They keep their directions by the sun. If the sun is hidden, the moss, which grows chiefly on the north side of the trees, helps them find their way. At night, they look for the north star, which is the brightest star and is quite easy to find. The two stars, which form the side of the Big Dipper, farthest from the handle, always point toward the north star. When the ice breaks up in the spring, the Indians make ready to go to the trading post. They put their tents and traps and all their belongings into their canoes. A big bundle of soft furs, the winter's catch, is placed in the middle of each canoe. Then they begin the long journey to the store. It may take them two or three weeks or even longer to reach it. If they had to walk all the way and carry everything, they would need the whole summer to make the trip. Canoeing is ever so much faster and easier. The life of the Indians is not easy. They often suffer from the long winter in the forest. Sometimes some of them get lost in blizzards and freeze to death. When the Indians are hurt or sick, there's no one up there to help them. At the best, tramping many miles every day on snowshoes or paddling heavily laden canoes up swift rivers is tiring work. Yet they have plenty of warm furs and blankets to wear. They have some other kinds of food in addition to the meat from the animals which they kill. The rifles and steel knives are much better for hunting than stone-tipped steers or arrows used for, for, in former times. They are fairly well off because the land provides them with food, clothing, and fuel, and because they can trade their furs for tools and weapons from southern Canada. The Fishermen of Nova Scotia You remember that we began our trip across Canada from Nova Scotia, the province which is farthest to the east and closest to the Atlantic. The sea around the coast of Nova Scotia teems with fish, and many of the people who live there make their living by fishing. The shores of Nova Scotia are much broken by inlets of the sea, which make excellent harbors. Some of these are tiny ports, just large enough for shelter a few fishing boats. Others are so large that they provide safe anchorage for many large ships. The whole coast is dotted with fishing villages built on the shores of, in, of the inlets. The houses of the fishermen are comfortable dwellings. Each house has a garden, in which the fishermen in their spare time grow potatoes, carrots, cabbages, and other vegetables. The boats of the fishermen range in size from small rowboats and motorboats to large sailboats called schooners. 
The small boats are used for fishing close to the shore. The big schooners, however, make long trips far out to sea, staying away from the port for months at a time, and returning only when they have secured a full cargo of fish, or when the fishing season is over. That part of the Atlantic which lies east of Nova Scotia is comparatively shallow. The deep sea fish come into shallow water to spawn. They can find plenty of food there. These are two reasons for the immense number of fish which are found in these shallow waters. The shoals which border the coast of Nova Scotia are called banks. The banks are separated by channels or gullies in which the water is quite deep. East of the banks of Nova Scotia is another great bank, which measures roughly 300 miles across. It is southeast of the island of Newfoundland and is called the Great Bank of Newfoundland, or more familiarly, the Banks. These banks are the finest fishing grounds in the world. Fishermen come there not only from Nova Scotia, but also from Quebec, Newfoundland, the United States, and from France to share in the harvest of the sea. They catch many varieties of fish, such as herring, halibut, haddock, and cod. Most of the big fish schooners of Nova Scotia are engaged in cod fishing. Each schooner carries a crew of 16 to 25 men, and two of these, two or three boys as helpers. When the cod fishing season opens in March, the schooner sets sail for the fishing grounds. In the hold are stored barrels of bait, usually small fish called caplin and barrels of salt to cure the fish. On deck there are 6 to 12 small boats called dories. When the fishing grounds are reached, the dories are swung overboard. Two men, one to row and one to attend to the fishing lines, form the crew for each dory. The dories are stationed at intervals along the course 4 or 5 miles long. The fish are caught either by hand lines or by long lines. The hand line is simply a long, stout cord armed with several hooks and weighed so that it will sink to the bottom. The long line is a thin but strong rope, 700 to 800 yards long, a yards long. An anchor and a flag buoy are attached to each end of it. Short fines are tied to the intervals of three feet or so, and hooks are attached to these. When the long fine is put in when the long line is put into the water, it sinks to the bottom and uses stretched out straight between the two anchors which hold it in place. The flag buoys mark its position. Sometimes the long line remains down half a day, sometimes only an hour or so, the time depending on how well the fish are biting. When the fishermen are ready to pull up the line in, one man rows the the dory slowly along while the other hauls up the line. This is back breaking work. The line is heavy and stiff and the fish are not light for a cod of good size weighs from 15 to 20 pounds. The fisherman is cramped too for the dory is so small that he cannot relieve his tired muscles by changing his position. Even in the evening the dories return to the schooner with the day's catch. The fish are put on board the dories are hoisted, and then the crew have their supper. The men have been up busy since 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, but the day's work is not yet over. The fish have to be cleaned, salted, and stored away in the hold before men can go to sleep. The better the fishing is, the harder the fishermen must work. The life of the fishermen is dangerous and hard. The banks are often swept by storms which take their toll on the fishing fleet. The fishing grounds are on the right path of the ocean steamers, and many a fishing boat is run down or sunk by them. The weather on the bank is often foggy, and this increases the danger of collision. When the cod fishing season ends in October, the schooners make for their home ports. If the season has been good, their holds are crammed with thousands of codfish. Their cargoes are worth a great deal of money, and they are easily sold, for the fish are always in demand. With the money received for the fish, the fisherman can buy almost anything he wants. He can have a lumber or brick to build a comfortable house, plenty of clothing to keep him warm and dry, and food of every kind. He can have good furniture and pretty pictures in his home. He can buy coal to warm it during the winter. 
He can have books to read, a piano, a phonograph, or a radio to give him music, or in fact anything he likes. The railways or boats which take away his fish bring back all these for him. His life is much pleasanter than that of the Eskimo or the Indian in the far north. He has a much better home, better food, better clothing, and many luxuries which they did not know at all. It is much easier for him to sell than buy than it is for them. You have seen how the Eskimos, the Indians, and the fishermen of Nova Scotia get their living. They all live by hunting or fishing. They all live in Canada. And yet, what different lives they lead! Now give the reasons for this great difference. End of section 2